Uh, if you will, please join Vice Chairman Langley as he does our invocation and Ed Booth as he does our pledge. Or Commissioner Booth as he does our pledge. <laughs> Uh, conflict of interest. Is there any? Is there any commissioner here who wishes to make a disclosure uh, regarding any matter that is before the board tonight? Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to approval of the, of the agenda. Motion to approve. Let me do that again. All right. Motion to approve. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I would like to amend the agenda if at all possible, since we have a motion on the floor. Well, we don't have a second yet. No. I, I'll second the uh, motion. We have a second. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to, and this doesn't need to be under my name, to be under a um, uh, commissioner, any commissioner's name, but I think we as a group, what, oh, excuse me. Huh. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, there's an issue that has just come to my attention, and I think it's come to some of the other commissioners' attention, that, um, we uh, may have some money in the sheriff's department, and that is money that needs to be considered by the commissioners what to deal do with as part of our oversight. So uh, I think that we should look at that tonight and think about it, and uh, maybe we could amend the agenda to, to bring that in and then improve the agenda. That would be okay. If that is the pleasure of the commissioners. I second that motion. I second that motion. We have a second. All those in favor of the amended agenda, please raise your right hand. Well, be before we before we do that, I think the public deserves an explanation of what we're talking about because no one knows. Turn it off, Commissioner. Turn yours off. Did I? Oh, okay. Thank you. Boy, I'll tell you. Technology. Uh, before we go, I mean, people, I think all the commissioners need to understand what this is about, plus the public. And that is the sheriff has accumulated about a quarter of a million dollars in his kitty, and now he wants to take that and divide it up into salary increases for uh, the people that are in his department. And, you know, that's not the way we budget in Beaufort County. We, this is a pretty big deal, and the commissioners are the people to approve this if it goes through. That's what the issue is. Okay, it's time to vote. All those in favor of the amended agenda, raise your right hand. All those, yep, so it's unanimous. Yeah. All those opposed, so it's unanimous. Okay, so we'll add that. We'll add that to uh, items for discussion. Will become item number four. And now we have a presentation from Anita and uh, Mr. Thompson, is that right? Good evening, thank you Mr. Chairman. I would like to introduce to you tonight Mr. Alan Thompson. He is the founding partner of Thomas Price Scott and Adams CPAs, and he's here tonight to present you with a summary of the fiscal year 1819 audit results. You do have a hard copy of that in front of you. If you'll look inside your audit report, what he will be reviewing tonight looks like this. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you'd be kind enough to flip over to page one. <coughs> And I know she's on page four, and that's okay. We're, I'm going to read a few things and talk about a couple things, and we'll get to the numbers if that's okay with y'all. Um, and just to make sure that you understand what my role is, my role is you, issue, you hire us to issue an opinion on the financial statements as a whole. We did issue an unmodified report, which is a quote-unquote good report. 
Uh, there were three findings in the report, all technical issues in regards to the uh, Medicaid program, no question cost of uh, materiality there. Um, on page one, outside of what I just said, no significant audit findings. On page two, no difficulties encountered in performing the audit. No uncorrected misstatements, no disagreements with management. Management did provide us with a representation letter dated November 7th. We're unaware that management consulted with any outside auditors, etc. The findings there were technical errors, as I mentioned. And then the other matters is simply talking about the uh, standards as it relates to OPEB, etc., which is on page three. On page four, the numbers. I don't uh, claim to know every important number that you may want to look at, so what I attempt to do is pull out some of the key numbers in the audit report that I hope you will find significant. And, not, and so it's not just a number standing out there uh, without context. We put the four previous year's audit reports beside it so you can get a feel whether the number is going up, down, sideways, et cetera, and get a much better feel for it. Having said that, total fund balance and general fund there is 21370000 Unavailable fund uh, balance is $4.9 million. Restricted and committed at 5.3. Total general fund expenditures, including transfers out, is $58,789,000. Fund balance available as a percentage is 27.98. Uh, both these percentage numbers, you're aware that the general state uh, statute or the state general statutes, is 8.33 percent is the minimum, which is basically taking 100 divided by 12 or one month uh, there. So uh, then an unassigned fund balance is 15979000 And then revenues over and under expenses before other financing sources. In the general fund, that's a positive $3.285 The solid waste is a negative 261000 The water districts is a minus 124764 and then cash and accumulated depreciation in the Water District's fund is $83 million in total fixed assets. Accumulated depreciation is 22.7, And then cash is $7,857,000. And then cash in the general fund is $20,352,000. And the Water District's again $7,857,000. The solid waste is $321,000. And then cash other governmentals is $4,924,000. Other governmentals really doesn't matter in terms of uh, trying to track it as much because you could have projects in there that one year you could have five million and next million, uh, next year you could have one million depending on what the uh, status of the project is. And then you see property tax rates there, collection percentages, collection percentages excluding motor vehicles. This used to be a bigger deal before DOT started uh, collecting all the, um, or DMV started collecting all the property taxes. Total property valuation there, again, with your levy amount underneath it. And then a breakdown of your debt uh, by type. Uh, it excludes uh, compensated absences and OPEB. And then a breakdown of your general fund revenues and a breakdown of your general fund expenditures. We don't talk, or I don't talk about a lot. Uh, if you were to look in your um, audit report, exhibits one and two, which are GASB 34, which try to take your governmental financial statements and convert them to business type activities, because uh, you generally do not manage the uh, general fund according to that. You manage it according to what you've always managed it, which is uh, annual budget, et cetera. Exhibits 1 and 2 are the old GASB 34 statements, which basically are for bond ratings more than they are for anything else. And the business or proprietary funds are presented there just as they would be anywhere else in the audit report. On page 5, you see total fund balance in blue and restricted in red at the top. And then you see the percentages analysis of fund balance available on the bottom with the county in blue and the group weighted average in red. Um, I did provide Ms. Radcliffe with uh, what the group weighted average, who's actually in there. It's a population and not necessarily a counties with similar uh, characteristics as much as it is just sheer population. On the top of page six, you see the unassigned fund balance as a percentage of general fund expenditures. On the bottom, you see revenues over and under expenditures before transfers uh, for the general fund, solid waste, and water district fund. On the top of page seven, you see cash versus accumulated depreciation. 
uh, parentheses there, funded depreciation. So you've got total fixed assets, accumulated depreciation in cash. And on the bottom, you see your total cash balances and total fund balances in a pie chart with the respective numbers right underneath that. And on page eight, you see your property tax rates with the group weighted average on the top. And on the bottom, you see your collection percentage with the group weighted average. Uh, and on both cases, uh, for the last period available, the county is right in line with the group weighted average. On the top of page nine there, you see the total property values and the levy amounts. On the bottom, you see your debt analysis by type in a pie chart. And on page 10, you see the breakdown in a pie chart by percentage of the general fund revenue and general fund expenditures. You see where you have valorum taxes there at 59.06 percent of your total revenues and that's why everybody's always tracking what the collection percentage is because it has such a big impact on what your total revenues collected are. On the bottom you see where education, human service, and public safety are the big expenditures by percentage there. I'm happy to answer any questions you got, not just now, but if you re read through the report, you got a question, you're welcome to call my office. If I happen not to be there, just tell the lady answering the phone, give you my cell number, and I will find you an answer. Questions? I have a question. Question, Richardson. I'm going to page six at the bottom of it. It says analysis of revenues over under expenditures before transfers. Yes, sir. And this year, we, I mean, we've got a pretty big number up there, 3.2 million. Yes, sir. Well, how, did we, why did, how did that happen? Well, you got a couple projects that, I, in essence, aren't included in that number that you transfer money out to. Um, like the jail locking system project fund actually had a million five thirty-five and transferred to it, so it comes off that three point two million. So when we say uh, before uh, other financing sources, it's not counting in the transfers out to other projects or other funds. So you had $2,112,000 transferred to other funds net. That figure that I'm getting that from is on page 73 of your actual audit report. But that's why there's a, a difference there between what you got in terms of before operating transfers and after. So the jail, in essence, the jail, the jail budget, fixing those jail cells at one and a half million, that's not a part of the budget that was added after the budget was done. No, sir. That's not what I'm really saying. I apologize for not being clear. What I'm saying is that the, other, the transfers to other projects or other funds weren't included on that specific schedule. That's all I'm really saying. I'm not saying it wasn't part of the original budget or anything like that. But in fact, was not. We did add it later. That's right. Okay, but but now let me ask this question: uh, With that 3.2 million dollars, we've already see where we spent half of it. How much of the rest of that money is committed to be spent? That's where you have to go back to your fund balance numbers and what's available at June 30th, which is on this page here, and it is the 15979428 That is the unassigned available fund balance at June 30th. That's spending money, if you will. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Page 73. Page 73. It's, it, it's indicating that there's 2.7 million. Am I reading that right? Variance at the bottom. It's, is that the total committed? No, sir. What that's really saying is uh, on just that other finance, because you had appropriated fund balance that technically never hits, which is a budget entry, it's not an actual number. That's causing you not or to have that variance there of the negative 2.7 million. When you appropriate fund balance to balance the budget, there's never going to be a dollar amount put in there for action 
because you're using prior year's excesses. So that's what's causing that 2.7 okay. So if you want to look at what the actual change in fund balance was for last year, um, it's the 1,195,514. We actually were able to add back right at $1.2 million to fund balance. And that's how it got from the, if you look back at your screen, from the 14.9 million to the 15.9 million, if you compare year to year. Okay. And I think she just put it back on the screen there. Um, so that's how we went from the 14.9 million here to the 15.979 million here. Anyone else? Here. Commissioner Waters. I, I'm not I'm not sure in the final product what the page number is, but in the one that uh, Anita had printed off for me on page 139 where we get to talking about the uh, significant deficiencies. Yes, sir. Would you would you just comment on uh, uh, to my knowledge, we did not have any last year. And, of course, I think last year was the first year we, we had had the separate audit. That's right. Yes, for sir. DSS. That's right. Yes, sir. Uh, but it appears that all these were related to eligibility. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and Melanie certainly knows more about this than anyone, um, of the three findings, I believe two of those were technical findings, and then the other one was related to eligibility. And she's available to speak to that if you'd like. Uh, if she does not mind. She's prepared. Okay. <laughs> I guess where I'm leading up to is that I know there's software out there that's provided by the state. That's correct. And that. <laughs> I'm assuming that some of this is related to the software or to the to the input, the information that's being inputted. That's correct. Um, some of these were um, where there's different categories of a program, where maybe the wrong category of a program was selected, but it was still the client was eligible. They just selected the wrong one. It is an ongoing issue with NCFAST every day having an issue with it not working correctly. I won't say that's all of where the issues came from, but certainly I think could contribute to some of them. And according to the uh, comments that were in here, is that uh, that was worked on or as of November, the middle of November, that additional training yes, was going to take place? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay, we're down to uh, public comments. We got three people signed up tonight. Um, and just as a reminder um, that each speaker has three minutes uh, to make your presentation. Um, again, the commissioners do not respond uh, to your comments. This, we're here to listen, to hear what you've got to say. This is not a town hall meeting. So first speaker is Mr. Tandy Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. My name is Tandy Dunn, and I'm a resident of Burford County. In December 2018, the trash collection site at Pamico Beach was closed. A company was hired to close it down and then design and expand the site to Ransomville. To date, that site still requires you to climb up steps to throw trash away. I know my mother cannot use that site, and neither can other residents that have mobility issues. Why have they not completed the renovation? Have they even started it? Do we require the contractors working on county projects to sign a contract with a completion date or a deadline date? Do they pay liquidated damages if they do not complete the project in time? We had a project um, a couple years ago to add antennas to our public safety radios. 
that was supposed to be put in on a new tower on Cherry Run Road. This project took way too long um, than necessary to complete. The contractor claimed delays because of weather. If they're not working on their stuff, what are they working on? Uh, if they have no incentive to complete a project in a time and manner, then they will work on something that pays better or is easier first. It is common in construction contracts for contractors to be assessed damages for late completion fixed on, based on a fixed amount per day. Hold into these contracts. Please follow up with the work to ensure that it's being done on time. I know if you had to go use that roll-off site, you wouldn't be able to negotiate those steps to throw your trash away. And I, I think it's a shame that we closed down the site that was working and make our people go to something that's not working anymore. Thank you. Captain Galen Swain. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> we got to talk about some things. This, uh, we say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag <clears throat> every time that, uh, that we start a meeting. And it says liberty and justice for all. And, that's the, and then we have uh, meetings without any uh, referendums and my money taken from me without being asked. It's the biggest load of horse manure I've ever seen pulled on 2nd Street is when we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I believe in it. We need to start abiding to it. And uh, <clears throat> Mark Twain said that Diapers and politicians need to be changed very often for the same reason. And I don't know if you guys have realized it, but if you total up the number of years we've had these same commissioners up here, it comes up to well over 100 years when Gary was alive. I hadn't crunched the number since then. But, uh, and I want to thank uh, the new man, John. Uh, nice to meet you. And, uh, you will have a lot of opposition probably, John, because we've had a lot of trouble in the past with uh, people from up north coming down. I'm not saying you're a carpetbagger, because I don't know you. I'm not, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not prejudiced, but uh, you go have a lot of opposition from the locals. You go have to do something to really show them you're one of us. <clears throat> I would suggest uh, maybe finding out what bank was in charge of the money that disappeared about $350,000, and we always hire outside help to do the painting. The windows are about to fall out of the courthouse because y'all don't trust the local painters or the carpenters or the welders, the jails. Uh, it wasn't done maintenance on it because y'all don't trust the locals. Everybody wants to hire somebody from out of town, and then they spend the money out of town. And I think uh, I might want to pick somebody from out of town, like a CPA, because due to the Freedom of Information Act, I think the records need to be checked in town. And uh, Mr. John, I'll help you show how the other half lives around here if you want to ride me around. <clears throat> Being from up there at Camp Douglas, you know, they had, that was a big POW camp. And the people around here are paranoid about the corporate baggers anyway. They had over 10,000 of us up there, 5,000 of them, close to 5,000 died from unfit conditions. But I'm with you if you'll show me that you're one of us. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry you hadn't been here very long. I've got tires on my trucks been here longer than you, but that don't mean you're a bad man. And uh, things like uh, the water. You don't know about the water here. About 30 years ago, Ed Bradley, CBS, told us don't drink the water. The Washington Daily News got a Pulitzer Prize for how bad the water Mr. is Mr. here. Swain. Sir? Uh, three minutes is up. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, I'm running for county commissioner because I'm going to fix this mess down here. Uh, Patricia Garrison, please. Good evening, commissioners and the taxpayers of Beaufort County. 
Is everybody nice and comfortable? You're dry. It's warm in here. We're all comfortable. We spent $1,100,000 on this building. Well, we've got 45 homeless veterans in Pitt County that live in a tent city. Somehow, we got our priorities screwed up. I think housing the homeless veterans is far more important than housing us. Government spending is out of control and the government is out of control. It's time for zero-based budgeting it's time for the will of the people to stand. We just had a liberal judge rule against the people of North Carolina that voted for voter ID. And it's time to rein in the government. We talk about the government and we the people. We the people, it's time for us to make sure that the county commissioners know what we want. It's time for the county commissioners to do what's best for the taxpayers. And that does not mean buying and selling property at the expense that we're losing money or that we are not able to house our veterans and support our law enforcement and our military as we need to. Thank you. Okay, we're down to uh, items for consent. Need a motion to approve. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. I have mo a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. <coughs> All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, five two. Okay, we're down to items for decision. Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The item you have in front of you is an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding for Flood Management Projects or Flood Mitigation Projects with the Mideast Commission, our local COG. Um, as you'll recall, in the past, we've used other agencies to do this work for us. This is when we receive funding from FEMA to do mitigation projects, whether there's elevation projects or buyout projects or other flood mitigation efforts. Um, the COG has uh, put in place a group that handles those that type of work now in-house here in the county, um, and they serve the, the, the counties in their region. Uh, this is an MOU that would authorize the county to engage the COG to do those type of future flood mitigation projects. Um, the funding for those services, as you recall, like all of them in the past, come through the administrative funds that are a part of the grant. So they're typically, I mean, it's not saying there couldn't be, but normally there is no local cost associated with that. It's paid through the through the grant funding. So um, again, this is an MOU that will allow us to move forward with, with doing those future mitigation projects with the COG, and we'd recommend your approval. Thank you. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Yes, I have a question. Good question. Okay, are we replacing the firm that's been doing this before out of Wilmington? That's correct. Okay, what are the advantages in using the COG to do this? Um, as you'll recall, um, there is a, a one of the one of the folks that actually worked for them worked for us and did a lot of our flood mitigation work. Um, they have the resources here locally to do that. Um, we believe that they understand the climate better here. They know the people. Uh, they know our projects um, because they've worked on our projects. They've collected the data for us on those projects. Um, it is here. It is local. Um, and we have those folks who we can walk down the street and have a conversation with them. Um, and we believe that they are, they, are, they are the best folks to do that job. We've had a conversation um, with the FEMA about contracting with the COG. They say that is appropriate under their procurement pieces. Um, there is also statute that allows us to contract directly with another unit of local government. The COG is considered a unit of local government. Okay, anything they are doing uh, going forward is going to be a new project. That's correct. The current projects that are that are being handled by the other consultant, um, they are already underway. And, and any new projects that come forward, we would we would use this MOU to engage the COG for those services. 
Commissioner Brothers? M Mr. Manager, I, I ask this question every time these contracts come up. Who set these hourly rates? They are set by the COG um, based on their hourly rates on what they would do their work for. Um, again, um, the intent, and we actually had them write that language in, in, um, in, the, in the contract or in the MOU. So if you'll see on page three of the MOU, actually page 102 of your, mm -hmm. of your packet, um, it reads that, that uh, the committee <coughs> intends to recover its costs through appropriate funds provided by the individual flood mitigation project with the goal of not having to seek additional funds from the county to complete the work. If circumstances occur that require additional county funding to be needed, the MIDIs will notify the county before such funds are expended. So we wanted to make sure that, as historically has been done, the, the administrative funds coming out of the grant pay for all that. Um, and if it's not, then we want to know ahead of time so that we can have conversations about it. Another thing, who, who monitored the hours? When you're getting $120 an hour and $90 an hour for a secretary, I want to know who's monitoring the hours. I might work eight hours one day from my house. They, um, they have a scope of work that they are charged with doing, and we would monitor that So it's a set, it's a, if they just come in and say, we're going to do this for five hours, that's all they get is just five hours. No, it's actually based on the, I mean, it would depend on the scope of the work uh, and how many how many homes were in that project, um, whether they were elevation projects, whether they were acquisition projects. Um, and in the grant itself, there's a specific percentage that's listed for admin costs, and uh, they would charge against that uh, to pay for those. So that's set by, by federal standards. There's a certain percentage and, and no more than a certain percentage is, is allowed under those contracts for admin. Uh, and that's why we said their intent was to cover that through admin and no local funds being expended in that. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, uh, Ryan, Ryan how's this, how this hourly rate compared to the other one, the prior one? I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head, but generally those numbers look about the same. I mean, the, plus or minus 10 or $20 an hour, uh, I would say. I mean, when, when you get into some, um, um, actually they're probably a little cheaper than, than some of the ones we've seen before. And as the new guy, what's the scope of this? It really depends. Um, on, the, on the actual project, either it's an acquisition project or it's an elevation project, and the scope of the work would be to take that grant, administer that grant, uh, if it were like an, uh, a, um, uh, an elevation project where they have to have contractors come in and do the work, they would actually do the, the bidding for that work. Um, they would monitor that work. They would make sure the inspections were done. Um, they would handle all of that. They would make the, um, the reimbursement. They would fill out the reimbursement forms coming back to us, make sure that all that's correct. We would submit it to, to FEMA for reimbursement. Uh, and that's what, they're, that, that's what they're paid to do. Anyone else? Time to vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All the, no opposed, this is unanimous, thank you. Katie. The Legal Women Voters of North Carolina has requested approval of the attached resolution, um, resolution celebration of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, giving women the right to vote. Um, happy to read the resolution or y'all have read it, it's up to you. Motion to approve. This is a second. 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 Discussion. Sorry. <laughs> Third. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Unanimous. Katie? Um, we do have some people that are interested in filling the spots on the Beaufort County Planning Board. I forwarded those to you earlier, and they're also in your packets. Um, it's up to your discussion whether to appoint or not. Uh, I have a Motion. question. The, sure. These people are filling unexpired terms. <clears throat> no, sir. They are three-year terms. They are people that have left the board, um, and the terms had expired in December, and we were struggling to fill those. That's why they're coming to you now. Okay, so the terms they're filling expired, three terms expired in December. Yes. So, uh, okay. Uh, they're interested in serving is, I mean, do we have enough applicants to fill them? Yes, you should have the three. I see them. Well, I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Unanimous. Who, who notifies the people? Do you? Okay. Commissioner Waters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, committee met, jail committee met, uh, myself, Jerry Langley, and John Rebolts. Uh, and in your package tonight on page 119 is uh, kind of a summary of the meeting. Uh, I'm going to zero in on the, on uh, the, towards the bottom of the page. The committee will research and evaluate the current situation, including sentencing and parole guidelines, and if any options are available. The practice of housing inmates in other facilities and the overall cost associated with that. What are the laws and issues related to segregating the populations? What are the safety concerns and options to resolve them? Evaluate the financial cost of partnering with another neighbor that ha either has excess facility or has a jail issue similar to ours. Evaluate options to outsource the jail operation in total. Evaluate what is needed and required in a new jail. The financial impacts of all options, including doing nothing. Uh, the other thing that we discussed was taking applications from the public for the two positions to represent the north side and the south side. Uh, I think our clerk has already received five or six applications. Uh, the committee suggested since we had not had a public meeting uh, that we wait and disclose that tonight and allow those applications to continue to come in until February the 1st, which would allow us in our February meeting to select those two individuals. So uh, I would recommend that we approve the, uh, the charter uh, and that we, in our February meeting, that we do the selection of the two additional uh, members. So we need a motion for the charter? Yes, I, I make that motion. Now. Have we got a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Discussion? Question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What members have you appointed already? Well, what we had talked about uh, was three of the stakeholders would be uh, the district attorney's office, uh, someone from the sheriff's office, and then also someone from the uh, judicial. And then the other one was the city of Washington would appoint somebody representing the city. So that would only leave two people that we would actually be getting applications from the public on. Thank you. Discussion? I think the other part of this was <clears throat> we were going to ask all of us if you had somebody you wanted to nominate to get that form in from them. The, the, the only problem I, when well, it's not a problem, I mean, I understand the majority rules. But you got someone from the, the judicial department. I read here you got Judge Sermon or Judge Parker. You got someone from the city of Washington. When they bring their recommendations back, none of them can vote whether we do or do not build a jail. So I, I kind of find it disturbing that I got to take a whipping for somebody else's decision. And that decision is to say we be a one and we vote to be a one. I got to take a whipping. They, they come by claim. So I, I don't have a problem with this committee, but I think it's the decision of these seven men sitting up here that got big enough backbones to say yes or no. I, I think as, as I view this committee, it is a working committee that brings information back to the Board of Commissioners. They do not make any decisions. The charge based on the charter and our discussion was that we bring back different options. Uh, you know, that, and any guidance that, any additional guidance that the Board of Commissioners want us to take a look at, we will do that. But no, you're absolutely right. They will not be making a decision on whether we build a new jail. But one of the charges was, was to look at our population and see if there was a way to make changes in that population. So, um, you know, there's no, de no decision has been made. This is strictly a group that's, that's more or less a research group, 
they can bring information back to the Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Richardson. Well, the focus on this always goes to building a new jail. Well, I'm right where I was three years ago. We need to manage the jail, and we need to manage the justice system that we have. The commissioners have put absolutely nothing into trying to manage the situation whatsoever. You go out and build a bigger jail, all you're going to be able to do is lock up more people for, for longer periods of time and throw the key away. If you've got no management now, a new jail, and that's what everybody wants to do, build a new jail building, a new jail building is not going to solve our justice uh, problem in Beaufort County. You know, we have a declining population in Beaufort County, so why do we have a jail problem? The jail situation should be getting better. Anyone else? Sam? Is the committee going to take up fixing the doors on an ongoing basis and to watch that and stay on top of it? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Time to vote. All those in favor of adopting the charter, please raise your right hand. The charter. Charter. All those opposed? <coughs> Five, two. You have that, Katie? Mr. Langman. Okay, what, what I'm after is really very simple. A lot of times we have a, a lot of resolutions that come before this board and uh, some pass that I agree with and some pass that I totally disagree with. And I just feel it's, it's, a, it's time for us to distinguish whether uh, a resolution passes unanimously or whether it is a 4-3 vote, 5-2 vote, instead of it appearing that every commissioner agree uh, to that resolution. And I, and I think that will weigh good for whether you are for it or against it, then that way, uh, especially your constituents will realize that no, all seven commissioners did not vote for this resolution. And it, it can be stated however you want to state it, but I just think there should be some distinction made uh, as to how people vote. Is there a second? I'll second that. Discussion? I have a question. Are you talking about at the end of the resolution listing the names of the people who voted for and the names of the people who voted against? No. I'll take it. I'll take it either way. You can just do the, the uh, numbers or you can do actual names. It makes me no difference. Since I seconded this, I'd appreciate it if we put how, who voted for what and what the total vote was, a complete history of the vote, if that would be okay. I'm fine with it. Commissioner Waters. Most, most of these resolutions that we pass are going up the ladder. And once it gets to Raleigh or once it gets to Washington, D.C., I know we would all like to think that they know who we are. But to me, the names are absolutely a waste. I have no problems putting there that it was seven to four or seven, seven zero or four to three. But I think putting the names is just, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they know you in Washington, D.C., one or two of us, but I doubt they know all of us. Definitely. Commissioner Richardson. Well, putting the names on the resolution is more of a local issue than it is a Washington, D.C. issue. And I think the, if, if you're going to go to this extent, then, you know, the majority is supposed to rule. Well, if you want to, to define the majority, then I think you need to list the names. You need to go whole hog with it or don't do it at all. So I'm not going to vote for it unless we list the names. I want to see the football game at 8 o'clock, so I'm not going to argue that point. <laughs> I'm ready to vote. Let's vote, Mr. Chairman. What, what are we voting on? Are we voting with the names or just? With the names, I think. That was are you okay with that? Do you want to make that? No, I'm fine with it. My second is conditioned upon that. The names. Okay, that'll be the vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Unanimous. I think as most of you are aware, our neighboring state to the north 
is attempting to severely limit the Second Amendment rights of their citizens. Today, the first of four bills, the first bills, came out of committee on their way to the Senate in Virginia. <clears throat> and the governor and the new leaders of their General Assembly have publicly stated their intent to adopt far-reaching gun control legislation this year. More than 100 cities and counties in Virginia have declared themselves Second Amendment sanctuaries where local law enforcement will refuse to enforce the new gun restrictions. So all of this, besides being an all-out assault on the Second Amendment, in my opinion, is going to cost Virginia a ton of money because this is going to inevitably end up in the courts and lots of legal battles are going to be pursued. So I want to prevent this from by joining four counties in North Carolina that have already passed the resolution, and Stokes County is voting on theirs tonight, along with Davidson County voting on it tomorrow. I believe, and I hope you share this, that if the counties and the cities across the state do the same thing, it will deter a future state legislature from trying to infringe on the Second Amendment. So the uh, resolution that you had in, favor, in front of you is, and I'm, if, you, if you've all read it, the meat of it is, in the last paragraph, be it further resolved that the government of the state of North Carolina shall infringe upon the inalienable rights granted by the Second Amendment, Beaufort County shall become a sanctuary county for all firearms unconstitutionally prohibited by the government of the state of North Carolina. In that, Beaufort County will prohibit its employees from enforcing the unconstitutional actions of the state government. Second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Discussion? I have a question. Okay. Now, I, don't, I like the Second Amendment, too. I like my little 22. I don't have that AK-47 like you got. I don't have it. But I like my little 22. <laughs> I don't but, have one yet. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but uh, explain this to me. You're, t you're asking us to vote for our citizens to do something even if the if the General Assembly of North Carolina says it's against the law. You're asking us to... to yeah. Huh? Yes. Okay. So you're asking us I, to... I'm asking you to do what there's been tons of counties and cities across the country do with regard to well, illegal aliens. Well, 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 the thing, question I'm asking, are you asking our residents to break the law if the law's passed? No. Okay. No, not the residents. Thank you. Any more discussion? Uh, the manager Go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I've read your resolution. I think we are asking the citizens to, to if we're going to be a sanctuary county for the Second Amendment, we are asking them not so much to break the law but adhere to the Constitution if an unconstitutional law is passed by the government because we're not going to have time as, as citizens, to uh, get a better, smarter, wiser government in place if they come and take our guns. We can't defend ourselves then. The next thing is going to fall is going to be the First Amendment. So we have, I think we are asking that uh, we challenge any unconstitutional laws coming out of Raleigh or coming out of a sheriff or a, county, a group of county commissioners. Could happen, and that's what that's the way I took your resolution. Well, I suppose it could happen, yes. But, and we're, we're the and, resolution, and, and, it, and I, I will it, vote on it, condition upon the fact that we're going to stand up to the unconstitutionality of an unconstitutional law being passed. And that's what this assumes. Yes. Okay, because because the Second Amendment is extremely explicit. It doesn't say a daggone thing in there about hunting. Yeah, it's something about it's, it talks about bearing arms right. to protect your life, liberty, your person. And also your, your nation. And to defend the Constitution, if need be. Commissioner Langley. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say, uh, I believe in the Second Amendment as well, but I, I just wish people would stop saying that the government is going to take come and take your guns. I mean, how many folk in their right mind, if you got guns in your house, I'm going to come to your house, and take your gun. No, that's not going to happen. And and any law enforcement officer who wants to go to someone's home, a law-abiding citizen, to take their weapons is an idiot. 
I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way to do that. And I don't think you can find a law enforcement officer anywhere who would say he would go to someone's home to, to, to retrieve their weapons. Now, if, if a person has committed a felony and they have firearms, yes, you're, you're supposed to go there and take those weapons. But beyond that, I just don't see that happening, gentlemen. Commissioner Richardson. Uh, well, you know, following up on what Commissioner Langley said, there are plenty of idiots that would be delighted to do this. You're, you're not going to have trouble finding them. Germany lost their weapons in the 30s. They were taken. Guess what? They still don't have them back today. So the big thing that I think we're getting out of this is not so much being aggressive on gun rights, but as sending a message to our legislators, hey, don't mess with this. Don't think about messing with this because it can happen that police show up at your house to take your guns in the United States of America. There are plenty of people working on plenty of laws and plenty of ways to wiggle to make this thing work. So. Unless we stand up to it now, we're going to have it, and this is one of the ways we can stand up to it, by sending a message. Um. Well, I, <clears throat> I think this goes beyond taking weapons. I mean, there's a lot of other legislation that's proposed that would be, in, based on my belief, would be invalid under the Second Amendment. And so it's, it's beyond just that. David. You know, when I read this uh, resolution, it, it, it strikes me that there are a number of undefined things in here. Uh, the words sanctuary county doesn't even come up until the final paragraph. Exactly what does that mean? Uh, and as far as firearms go, uh, it, this is limited to firearms. It's not make it as broad as you want to in your thoughts, but it doesn't cover anything but firearms. And who's going to determine what's unconstitutional? You are, you are, you are. Yeah, the board. So, uh, sorry, this just <laughs> strikes me as being unconstitutional on its face. Brian, did you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I, I, I guess what I would say to you is, is um, just a comment from a, from a county perspective for county employees. Obviously, when you're dealing with firearms, that's more of a law enforcement matter. Um, and law enforcement at the county level is handled by the sheriff's office. So there probably would not be a lot of interaction beyond the sheriff's office and something like this. But as you read... I mean, as I read that last paragraph, what you are essentially saying is you would prohibit county employees from enforcing a valid law that was passed by the state of North Carolina, the General Assembly, and you would ask them to break the law. Um, what I would suggest to you, the better way to do that is to say you would stand aggressively against that and take any legal action and court action to do that through the court system instead of making a county employee you're essentially saying to a county employee, you must break the law because we're telling you to break the law. And that puts them in, a, in an incredible situation. Uh, I think you get your point across in saying something else. But to tell a county employee, I mean, w what are they going to do? They're either going to break the law or you're going to fire them. I mean, and, and if you're telling me that I have to tell a county employee who works for me that they will break a state law, I will not tell them to do that because you, you can't, you, you cannot, <laughs> you're asking them to break the law. And, and as a board, you, you can't do that. Um, the General Assembly passes laws. It's like someone telling them to break one of your ordinances. We wouldn't do that. It, it, was, it was constitutionally passed. It was legislatively passed. It was locally passed. Um, I think there are other ways that you can get this point across by saying you would um, go through the court system, and you would not put your employees in, a, in the position that you're saying you're going to put them in in that by telling them they have to break the law. Commissioner Langley? Yeah, because also, and I think if you, you ask any sworn law enforcement officer, it is in their oath to uphold the laws that, that come before them, and so you are putting them in jeopardy when, when you say you want them to do any, anything uh, resembling that, because that would be for them to uh, violate the oath that they swore to. 
Uh, John, has a question. Um, it just strikes me that if you look at the map of Virginia, there is a handful of counties that have not passed this type of legislation. Um, and it's, I mean, it's virtually the whole state is that way. So I'm not quite sure how that's all going to work out, but the legislature needs to get this message that they need to back down. What? Uh, excuse me. Litigation. Oh. What, what litigation is going on with well, them passing this law? debating an well, issue that they should stay out of. They'll be asked. Uh, Go ahead. The question I have is, there's none of us sitting up here can, where we can vote our legislators out. But if memory serves me well, they can, they can pass a law and say, we're we going to dispose of y'all. And there's nothing we can do about it. That's the law in North Carolina. Am I correct, Mr. Manager? So when they pass laws, they, we cannot go above what they pass. But we can do some things that, that, that su not supersede what they pass, but we can, we can go against their, their laws with our ordinances. But you cannot pass, when they pass an ordinance, if they say you don't have but five commissioners sitting at this address and you book seven, you have passed, that's their call. Now, that's, that, that's when I first came on. If that's true, that they, 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 they have the authority to dispose of us. Is that correct? Legislators? Commissioner Booth, the, you know, the saying is uh, counties and municipalities are creatures of the General Assembly. Thank you. And essentially what that means is they created you and they can do away with you if they wanted to. I don't know that that's ever happened, but, but we do get threatened with that occasionally, that they do, that, that they do have that power. Commissioner Dethers. Um I think what Commissioner Ripholtz has pro uh, proposed is a very bold um, resolution. And it's, it's new, and it's probably such that we don't know all there is to know about sanctuary counties for the Second Amendment. But we need to learn and find out about it. Um, you taking this on now and bringing it to us is a good start. How far do we go? Do, do we pass something with no teeth? Or do we pass something with teeth? Or do we wait? and find out how much teeth we can put in it. Because I can tell you right now, if you pass something that has no teeth, well, it has no forbearance on what needs to be done, it's, we're not doing anything. So who decides what's constitutional and what's not? The elected officials do and the Supreme Court. That's the way it works. We're, we're the ones that have to take what the people want and we're elected to do their will. And the people who are my constituents want us to protect the Second Amendment at, at every cost. There are people in this nation who are right now wrapping themselves in the Constitution, a document that they do not understand. And they keep saying things like, a republic, if we can keep it, madam, from, from uh, Benjamin Franklin. I know they'd never heard that before until the last few days. And they will wrap themselves in this Constitution, not understanding what our forefathers wanted us to do. And when, when we take this oath to, to defend the Constitution, we defend it in its entirety. So I'm telling you, if you do not do this in a way where we have enough teeth in here, we might as well not do it at all. So is this something we need to table and bring up after we research it a little bit, or do we need to do it now? <coughs> Vote. Commissioner Richardson. Look, I don't want to table this. This is, as, as you described, Commissioner Deathridge, a bold statement. Unless we make bold statements and stand up to the people who are going to subjugate us, take our guns, and tell us what the law is, then, then we are going to wind up as slaves to, uh, to others. We need to take a strong statement on this. Go back to the revolution. Think about the revolution. The bold statement that was taken then, the British soldiers were sent to Lexington and Concord to take those people's guns. Guess what they got met with? More guns than they wanted to be met with. Unless we send a strong message, then this is not going to fly. Constitutional and unconstitutional, the, the, there, there are a lot of principles that go on with this. But if you're going to sit around and wait on these liberal judges to make decisions for you, I can already tell you the answer. You know, just go ahead and turn your guns in because it's over with. Unless the elected officials 
take a strong stand. We represent the people of Beaufort County. This is going nowhere. And you can listen to all of this Mamby Pamby talk about we need to water this down. This is our first statement. This does not, first statements don't need to be watered down. We need to show that we mean business. You can always water it down later. You can always surrender later if you want to. Mr. Richardson. Okay, keep it, I'll keep it short. I, I don't want to water it down later. I want it to be strong now and strong later, or stronger later. So, I mean, we're going to do this. Have a, uh, we're we're going to firmly endorse the Second Amendment by creating a sanctuary county in the county of Beaufort. We need to, we need to have a backbone about it now and in the future. Mission Waters. I, I don't think a lot of people realize that when you live in a rural area like like I do, that having a gun is pretty important. Uh, you know, when I go home tonight, I may be confronted by a red wolf, a coyote, a hybrid, a black bear, a cat. I'm not talking about a little kitty cat either. So it 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 is very important for us to be able to defend somebody breaking in, but it's also important to be able to defend somebody that something that's on my property that poses a threat. And I think we have to make a bold statement uh, and uh, let somebody challenge us. So I'm going to support. Okay, we're ready. You're doing real good not to be up for re-election. <laughs> Okay, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of the amendment, raise your right hand. All those opposed? 5 2, Katie. Booth and Langley. <laughs> Booth and Langley. Okay, Stan. <laughs> okay, Stan. Okay, uh, since we uh, fortuitous that uh, Mr. Well, it's fortuitous that uh, I'm, this is coming up right now on the heels of uh, actually supporting the Second Amendment boldly as we just did in a 5-2 vote. This is just as important, more, it may be even more important because this is an effective address of a problem we could have here in Beaufort County. And, uh, and once it happens, it's too late if you haven't got it in place. In the past, we've, not, we've elected not to support a resolution by a vote of, I believe, four to three to allow all law-abiding citizens to conceal carry in almost all government buildings. Okay. That would, that would uh, mean taking down the sign, the uh, gun-free zone, which has become a free fire zone in other parts of the country where they've had the, the complete unfortunate by having a, an evil shooter, assailant, taking down people <coughs> with great prejudice. So what I have presented tonight is a resolution to allow only Beaufort County employees, should they be uh, law-abiding citizens, have a concealed carry, and want to carry on the premises, that they can carry, and nobody can tell them not to. We as county commissioners are the ones who are setting forth policy, which will allow these citizens, these, these um, employees, to carry on the premises. Now, that's the way I've written it is most Beaufort County buildings. That does not include the courthouse. That does not include the schools, since they have a governing body. Eventually, I'd love to see that happen, but right now we have to take this in small steps. But this does not preclude uh, any buildings where there is a, um, uh, a, a group that we appoint or is appointed by any other uh, politician saying we don't want it. If you don't want it, that's too bad. We think the employees should be able to carry because they would be able to protect themselves and their uh, citizens that inhabit that space around them, and that's most important. Um, just recently in Houston, there was a church shooting. I think we're all aware of it, and you might not have heard or read about it on the news, but it was the news sources that I rely on made mention of it very quickly, that within six seconds after a shooter started 
firing within a congregation of over 200 people. And that could have been great destruction because they're all in pews, sitting ducks. Two, two men pulled out their firearms. They were licensed to carry, and they, they were able to carry because they had that policy in that church. And they took down that shooter, and only two people died. It could have been tens of people being killed, slaughtered, with, the, with that many people in the congregation. Now, I would hate to think here in Beaufort County that we deny our citizens, our employees, the right to carry. It's a con their constitutional right to protect themselves. And we, we deny them. We're denying them their constitutional right. Let me digress just a moment. One of the reasons I brought this up and rewrote the, uh, this resolution, which is completely different than the one I presented two months ago. The reason I brought it up is because after the last resolution failed, I talked to a number of <coughs> county employees who came to me and said, Stan, I would like to carry on the premises. I don't feel safe. And a lot of the, the employees that talked to me were Department of Social Services employees, specifically Department of Social Services. Lord forgive me. Now, for whatever reason, they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe in the building, and they don't feel safe in the parking lot. Now, when they carry in the building, they are protected there. When they carry in the parking lot from the building, they are protected. When the gun is in their car, they're not protected. So if this is what I got from them. I think we need to think about their safety. This is an issue. Of course, this is a Second Amendment issue. Politically, we'd be wise to pass it. But from a practical, from a protection point of view, it is important, essential, that we protect our employees in these buildings. And I think we would be quite on rise as commissioners to say, no, you can't. We'll wait for the sheriff to come, and they'll be able to take down the killer and count all the deaths and be able to investigate all the deaths that happened that could have been stopped. Should somebody in one of those offices have their gun ready to go? Maybe one of them would be brave and bold enough to take on that shooter in the hallway. Who knows? But we, they'd be much better off having protection than no protection whatsoever. And I really want you commissioners to think about it. You just passed a bill, five to two, effectively in support of the Second Amendment. Now pass this, five to two, effectively supporting it in our real terms. Commissioner Langley. Commissioner Deathred, I understand everything that you said, and I disagree with you 100%. I mean, and I understand that you said that some folk from uh, social services came to you and said they don't feel safe at, at work and they wish they could carry their weapons, but I, I, I just don't agree. And, I, and I've said this before. We've all worked with people that we know for a fact do not need to have a gun on their person especially in the workplace. Everybody who works for the county, and I'll say this and you can eat me up later, everybody who works for the county is not stable. It's, it is just that simple. I don't care what workplace you go into, everybody who works at certain places, they're not stable. And now you're going to tell them they can come to work with a gun. And the minute somebody really teased them off, I got a gun. And that's not someone off the street who has just walked in. It is an employee who now has the gun and turned on their co-workers. I, I just don't agree. And, and my other thing is this. Everybody who has a gun has not been trained to use that handgun. A lot of folk, let me, let me just show you this simple example. They pull the gun out and they stick their finger all the way through the trigger and then when they pull, when they pull this way, the gun goes this way. So instead of shooting here, they're shooting there. And then the next thing is they don't know how to control their breathing. So they're, and every time they do it, this is what you're getting. That's a recipe for disaster. I do not agree with it, and I'm never going to vote for it. Thank you. I don't know whether everybody in the county work for the county stable or not, but God knows I don't want to sit up his side of him with a gun. <laughs> Commissioner Waters? I, I think we're talking about two things. I, uh, I'm a strong believer in the 
in the previous resolution as it relates to what I have in my possession inside of my home protecting that territory. But I worked with a bank for 30 years, and I never was allowed to carry a gun. And guess what? We got robbed a lot. But our employees were not allowed to carry a gun. What we were told to do is give them the money, lock the door, and call 911. I, if we have a situation with a county agency the size of the Department of Social Services, we don't have to have concealed weapons by the employees out there. We just need to hire somebody that's carrying a gun and has got a uniform and protects the front door and protects the parking lot. I will not support having employees bringing their concealed weapons to the workplace. Is there, is there a second? Do we have it? Yeah, you got one down on me. Did you second? Oh, yeah, I'll second. No, okay. I'd like to speak you, to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Well, on that, we've talked about this before. There will be a set of rules that are put together about county employees carrying guns, and we've talked about all of the different ways that this can work and the ways that it can be done. And I will say this. County employees have approached me and told me they would be more comfortable if they had a gun or they knew someone in their department or building had a gun. It's a deterrent. The first thing these guys say if you look at them when the police arrest them is, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. You just killed five people, but don't hurt him. Okay, so this is a deterrent, and, that, and, and I have spoken to no employee who said, I don't want anybody that's an employee carrying guns. Uh, so uh, if we have employees that are unstable, that's the management's problem. They need to take care of it. John? I think uh, you alluded to the church in Texas, and they had a defense plan, and all of those people that had a concealed weapon there would have been trained and had been identified, and everybody in the congregation knew who they were. It wasn't like anybody, everybody was just bringing in a gun. I mean, I don't know. I can, I can support this if you say we're going to have rules and training and selected people that will be allowed that everybody would know who has it. If that's what you're trying to get to, is the protection of the, the people in the building. Um, I think that is important. Uh, let me look at, let me talk to it about on two levels. First of all, it's important to have people who are well-trained. I don't know how important it is for everybody to know who is well-trained and who is carrying. It's almost like the air marshals. If the shooter knows who's got the gun, they may try to neutralize that person first. If they don't know who's got the gun, they don't even know if everybody may have a gun when they walk in there. There's a good chance they'll be careful and not do that. It will dissuade them from coming into this public building and shooting. And I'd like to speak to what uh, Commissioner Waters said. You're talking about a bank. A bank is all about money. These people come in public buildings. They're not trying to take the money. They want to take lives, and they want to take as many lives as they can as quickly as they can. For whatever reason, that is their evil intent. Now, it's not, we're not going to be able to get into their demented minds, their deranged minds, and understand why they do these things. The FBI is even having trouble with it. But there is a sickness afoot in this nation right now when people are killing good people just because they're evil. And they know they're evil. And they, they, they had that evil within them, and it must come out, and it comes out by killing others, whether it's with a gun in their possession or a, a, a bomb, whatever. It's sad, but that's what's going on in our nation. Now, if we protect and harden our citizens, protect and harden, harden our employees in our government buildings, they're going to be a lot safer. I'm telling you, if this happens, and you guys vote against it because you're making jokes about who's carrying and who's not carrying and who's, who's not able to handle a gun, as Jerry said, and who can, Ed, of course, alluded to me not being able to handle that's a gun, right. like he knows. But if, we're, if that's what it's going to come down to, we're going to make this a, a joke, then you guys got a lot of liability if this happens in this county. And I think you should take this seriously. David, you have a comment? Uh, just <clears throat> Thank you just wanted to mention that this originally, in, in about 90 percent of what's been offered today in a, a resolution, 
was presented on October the 7th. Uh, originally, it failed on a three by three to three vote, not a five to five, three three to three. Uh, it was again offered uh, November the 4th last year, and um, the commissioners passed a uh, uh, a motion that it would not uh, come up again until uh, for six months, uh, which would be, I think, the May meeting. Um, there's a few words changed, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're wrong. You're wrong because there's a lot of words changed. I wrote the first one. I wrote this one. And the concept is totally different. To allow citizens to protect themselves and to allow the, the vast public at large to protect themselves. There's no mention in this about taking down the uh, gun-free zone sign. So I think you're wrong. You're just making a political point. I wish you wouldn't do that. This is, this is a government. We're a governing body. We're elected to do what is right, not listen to our hired hands. You may certainly do what you want to do. And uh, you're the commissioners. I'm not. I'm That's just, right. I'm just correcting you from what you said earlier. No, you're wrong. That it was a 5-2. It was a 3-3. Three well, three. It nobody asked you. Twice nobody before. asked your opinion. This is the third. Stan, one. that's enough. Did he look good? Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, you know, you're acting silly. This is a joke for you people. This is serious. I, I don't have a yeah. Brian, you had a comment? Uh, yes, sir. Just from a technical standpoint, not that I'm giving... Um, I'm not in the political conversation there, but just from a technical standpoint, I would suggest to the board that you need to remove the word most. You need to define what that is. Um, a resolution that says you can carry in most buildings, you need to say in all buildings except those specific that they cannot. Just by saying most, I th it falls on it. it it's it's got to be specific. If you're going to pass this, you've got to be specific on it. You can't just say most because some people would say, well, most is everything, including social services. So what I would suggest to you, if you're going to pass this, you need to say in all county-owned, operated buildings, except whatever. Um, so I would ask you to do that to be specific. The second thing I would ask you to do if you decide to pass this is to stay it for at least 60 days to give us the opportunity, as Commissioner Richardson said, to put some plans in place um, instead of just opening the door and saying anybody and everybody at any time. Thank you. Commissioner Waters? Uh, yes. I, I just want to correct what you're saying, Stan. I do not want the public to believe the statement that you just said twice about this was a joke. I'm, it's not a joke with Frankie. I'm taking this very serious. I want you to understand that. And I would ask that you would back off from that kind of language. You know, let's, let's face the fact. You, you put this out there on your website. I mean, it's, it's interesting that the DSS employees are calling you and they've not called me. I don't know about the rest of these guys up here. Huh? Okay, I guess I'm the one to speak now. Well, they, wait a minute, Stan. I, I think you've said enough. He's addressed, I think, I think, he's addressed me, I get to speak. I call when for a vote. Finishes. I'm calling for a vote. Call a question? The call of a question is debatable, and the debate is not over. It has to be voted on if you're going to call a question. Let's vote on the call of question then. Has everyone not had a chance to so speak on it? Everybody Every, everybody's had a chance to. So it's time to so vote. So that's not debatable. As long as question. one commissioner wishes to speak, this is a deliberative body. He should be allowed to speak. It's as simple as that. And you guys have denied me. You're denying Stan. You just trample on people's rights as commissioners. It's been called a question. So we're ready to vote. We're voting on the question. The question is no, 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 no. We're voting. The question is debatable. You need to rule. Let's, you need to go back and look at her. No, just because, just because somebody decides he wants to vote doesn't mean we vote. Calling the question is debatable as to whether the debate will continue or not. It's, it's a question. question. It's, it's question. questionable. It's, it's debatable. And it's it's been called a question. Majority I think so. Go ahead. No, you ask the ask ask the attorney over here for his opinion on this instead of this majority rule stuff. Okay, we'll vote on the question. Is that what you want? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? 
Call in favor of what call, now? Call in the question. Call the question. Yeah, all those in favor, call in the question raise your right hand. All those opposed? We're going to call it a question. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Deffers, please raise your right hand. The way it's written. Hold on, man. No, we're done. That's been cut off. Yeah, I would, me, me amending this uh, to, to listen to the manager, his, his wisdom, his prudence, is shot. That's gone. I can't do it. I would like to. I would like to, but I can't. It's been it's been shut down. Your 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 the information up here is shut down right now. We're back to trampling on people's rights that need because, to be defined uh, you know, before you vote. To, you don't know what you're voting on. Exactly. I, I, what the manager said. I'm in agreement with all of it. I will amend this. I would like to get everybody's vote up here. Well, I think this is very serious. Then why don't you withdraw it and come back next month? If it's going to fail tonight, I'll do that. But I don't want to hear, I, don't, I want to vote, but I'm not going to have to hear our em employee, our point, pointy, the attorney, telling me I can't do this. Well, I don't think there's any, any, I don't think there's any problem with that. It's the language you used. Ooh. What, the language? In, I think the language yeah. fine. Now, well, you do. I obviously, you said it. What? I think the language in the, in the resolution is fine. Uh, no, I'm talking about let, me, let me counsel Commissioner Deathridge, Mr. Chairman. Okay, okay go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Deathridge, you are going to be much better off to bring this back next month because of... I'm pressing the button. Oh, I kept my finger on it. Oh, gee. All right, thank you. The, 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 you're going to be much better off to bring this back next month with some refinement because Ed Booth, the instant this is voted on, is going to put up another one of those that can't come back for six months. So you're in control if you withdraw it. You will lose control if you don't withdraw it. Mr. Richardson, is that Ed Booth right to do that? Is, is that his right? Absolutely. Thank you. No. I withdraw the uh, resolution until next month. I withdraw the second for it to come back. All right. Uh, it's on the agenda for next month. Re no. Excuse me. Rewritten. Thank you. No. No, it's been passed. The second the question been called, and we voted on. No, you didn't. We haven't voted. We haven't voted. We voted on calling. We voted on calling the, the question. question. So, so we withdrew it before it could be voted on. So he's in order. That's hood rule. Yeah, I don't see that. Well, no, these are my rules. No, this time. no. So we ready to vote? Yes. On, on what? On what? On his motion. He, he has withdrawn, and I withdrew the second. So you got nothing to vote on. So we just wasted all this time. Nothing. Yeah, He's right. He's hey. right. All right. Okay, Mr. Richardson, you're up to planning retreat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a straight. This has been a real problem tonight. The uh, uh, I move that we uh, film the planning retreat and put it on uh, on the cables. Uh, system for the people of Beaufort County to see. Is there a second? Second. Oh, okay. Is there any discussion? Time to vote. All those in favor of filming, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, raise your right hand. Five to two, no filming. Uh, Mr. Richardson, website. Okay, there's here we go. I got it right this time. There's, <laughs> there's a link on the county website, and the copy of the link I'm talking about is on page 129, but on page 130 is the item that I find offensive. It has to do with, um, with climate change and clean energy. If you look at the top of the page, the, uh, page 130, the very first paragraph, it says, uh, on October the 29th, 2018, Governor Roy Cooper signed into law Executive Order Number 80, North Carolina's commitment to address climate change and transition to clean energy economy. The North Carolina Department of Environment Quality has created a website to provide more information uh, about the uh, order and its impact on state agencies. This is a political statement. It doesn't need to be on our website. It's a political opinion because we know that things may be getting a little bit warmer. We don't know why. And it, to, for, to make a long-range 
uh, predicament, uh, uh, a long-range policy decision that we're going to do away with coal and oil and some of these other things at the moment is totally wrong. We should let the market decide on this. The Earth has been here for literally billions of years. We have been measuring temperatures now and climate for only about and in any degree of accuracy for probably less than 30 years. You simply don't have enough information to set policy and make decisions. This is better left with the marketplace uh, deciding these things. So I think this should be pulled from the website because there's no scientific uh, basis for it. Brian? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to be clear with the board, um, what we have on our links page, as Commissioner Richardson um, spoke about, is a link that takes the, the web user to the SWATA litter bug site. That is where if you see somebody littering and you want to report them, you can click on that. It takes you to an online form that you fill out and submit to the DOT and they investigate that. On that same page, if you look at the right, is where you see the additional links that are done by the State of North Carolina Department of Transportation. We have no control over that. If you want that to be gone, then you will need to do away with the link that we have on our page that takes you to the SWATA litter bug uh, website. I mean, we, we can't control what DOT puts on their site. So, Commissioner Waters. Uh, Commissioner Richardson, the reason it's on the website is in the Solid Waste Committee, we've had discussions on litter and how to improve that. And one of the things you can do is go to DOT. When you get to that, that link, there's 10 choices that you make, but we're referring them to the litter bug report, so I'm opposed to dropping the link. I mean, we're not, a, we're not asking to read everything. That's their choice. What we're sending them there for is when Katie gets a call or, or when somebody complains, I can tell them to go to our website that there is a form that they can get from DOT. Commissioner Richardson. Well, I'll have a problem with the litter bug thing. We've had a litter bug thing in here a long time ago when we handed out cards to people and did all kinds of things. I'm delighted that, that we have that on there. Not a problem at all. But if, I think that we can pass this uh, resolution and send it to the governor and let him know of our displeasure. Uh, with how he's using that site for political purposes. John? I think that they could probably rewrite the link and take you straight to the form. You're right. It does take you straight to the form. No, well, no. If, if you click on that link that we have, it takes you to that form. You'll see it says submit a litter bug, SWAT a litter bug report, and that's the page where you enter the information yeah. and hit But submit. I think if you, if you click on that form, that link to the form on the state site, then you can copy that URL and make that the new link. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, I, all I know is that you click there and it, it pulls up the online form I, and, and you've got to click again to get into the other DOT stuff. So we can investigate oh, okay. that. We can okay. investigate that to see. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Sam. All right. Uh, the problem with this is, the manager said it succinctly, is we're, we're dependent upon the state site. We, we, could, we could create another page, a link, and you would not see any of that. But as soon as you click through, you're going to go to the state site and it's going to be there again. You're just adding layers. So basically, uh, the only thing we can do here is ask the people who run the state site that has that page with that link to please remove uh, politically charged uh, uh, climatic uh, data or uh, propaganda. We call it whatever you want to call it. I call it propaganda, but uh, you guys might want to call it something else. Do we have a second? Yeah, oh, you did? No. What's the uh, resolution? I mean, what's the, uh, the resolution is to, to move. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The motion is. Uh, the motion is to remove the uh, uh, information on there having to do with uh, uh, well, climate change and clean energy. And this is going to go to the state of North Carolina. You go to the state of go to the governor's office in the Department of Transportation. Yeah. Are you, so you're seconding that? Yes. Okay. Any more discussion? 
Mr. Chairman, just so I'm clear, you, you, what the what Commissioner Richardson's motion is is for us to write a letter to DOT to ask them to remove that from the link because that's the only way we can get to the Swatter litter bug site. Okay. Okay, time to vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Five, two. We got an order. I'm against. He's against. You're against. Item for discussion. Whoops. Yeah, Mr. Richardson. Well, Commissioner. We have the, the, the first item is Brenda Hamilton um, and the status of what is going on with that work. And we have the chief deputy here and, and the, and the uh, manager. We'd like to hear from them. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Micro Trace does have um, items of evidence that they have been looking into. Um, some of that they've been able to get several layers into and that they've done some testing. So far as far as results goes, there really haven't been anything other than things that have been found through other avenues of testing. Um, but since they are the, the fiber um, analyst experts, and we're talking about microscopic level here that you can't see with the human eye. Um, they are uh, conducting more tests on what they've been able to find, some of them in the samples that uh, were, were taken from the dogs that were seized and then that we, that animal control housed for several days for us. Um, nothing really new as far as any evidence that would lead us to a direction of what type of animal attacked Mrs. Hamilton, but we are trying to exhaust all leads and they are working. Um, we have received some bills um, from them within the last uh, month or so, um, and but we not we have not received any written reports on the findings. There have been several phone conversations between some of the lab analysts and some of our investigators just so they can get more information on what we are looking for. So those conversations have been had, and that is uh, is the update up to this point. Unless there's any further questions from any commissioners. Yes. Any other questions? Commissioner Waters. I, I guess because of the fact in February it's going to be a year, um, if, if we are not getting any indication on how soon they're going to turn it, is, I, I know that, that you and the investigator and, and the committee we talked about waiting until we got that before we ever sent the information and all the material to the University of Florida, do you still think we should wait or at some point are we just going to well, send to the University of Florida what we have? At, at some point, we are either going to receive information that can definitively classify what we're looking for or they are going to get to the point where they can exhaust all leads for what they are looking for. Um, and the, the I will... I will say that I know that in the grand scheme of life and the speed of life that it seems like this is going slowly. But I, ju I just, as much as I can put out there that I, I would advise patience and caution because they are looking for things that they can't see with the human eye. They, they, are, they are trying to find things that other people have looked and can't find. And the University of Florida is most likely, you know, good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. They're still going to be here a month from now or two months from now when they can finish up what, what's going on. So um, Charlie Rose's opinion is is that we let these, these folks do their work and then we wait just like the plan that we had until we can get everything together and we can give the reports that we've collected from all of these labs and get all of the information at one time to the University of Florida and let them recreate and gather and do their thing with all of the information as opposed to piecemeal. Um, but that was, it was really a committee's decision um, that, that we were a part of, our folks were an active part of, and, and the conversations were very good. So if the committee needs to get together and, and we talk about it and as a committee we come up with a, with a different opinion, then I'm personally fine with that. 
but that's really probably more of the, de the decision of the commissioners and Commissioner Richardson, who is the head of that committee. Yes, sir. What? Commissioner Richardson, public works update. Ne next item is uh, jail door repairs. And I guess the main question I have is when are we going to start making the repairs? <coughs> Good evening, Commissioners. As a review, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services approved the submitted project documents on December 18th of 2019. Our representatives from both Montgomery Technology as well as Southern Folger were on site January 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, Southern Folger is the manufacturer of the sliding devices, so their technicians were here on site to take additional field measurements so that they could return to San Antonio and create the actual production drawings. Again, as a reminder, per the contract, um, Montgomery Technology has 14 weeks from approved submittals, so again, that's back from December 18th, uh, to provide materials. That is uh, March 25th. And then from that point, they have 12 weeks to complete the installation, which is June 17th. Um, as far as when construction will start, I do not have a date yet. Uh, they have just gotten the, they are working on the production drawings now, so there is not a firm date on when the availability of materials. Uh, but the representatives that were here do not think that there will be an issue uh, completing the contract per the, completing the contract per the times listed in the contract. <coughs> Uh, the second item, the AMI project, again, um, the meters as well as the infrastructure have all been installed. Uh, the read rate per the contract is actually 98.5%, uh, and so they are working to achieve that read rate throughout the county. We have 43 routes, or we did have 43 um, routes around the county. Uh, Ferguson is currently reaching that 98.5% on the routes on the north side, and they have submitted that information to MeterSys, which is reviewing that, and then we'll submit it to project staff. Um, currently, there are less than 300 meters that are considered stale. The definition of stale means that it has not transmitted a reading in the past three days. Uh, generally, about 100 or so of those could be due to high water because of the excessive rain in the past few days. Uh, census is continuing to troubleshoot and enhancing the network, uh, but again, as a reminder, the bill, the um, AMI system is being used on a monthly basis in order to create bills and to send the bills out. And again, the contract completion date is 6.30, so again, they're well within their allowed um, time of the contract. Okay, the only, the only <coughs> thing that I have heard that's out of order is that some people are getting water bills for like three and four times what they normally get water bills for? Is, is very much of that going on? I do, do not believe so. Anita may, may be able to speak to that more. Uh, there are some people that have had an increase, but I'm not aware of two to three times. No, sir. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Mr. R Commissioner Richardson, you want to talk about flood maps? I'll uh, ask the manager to update us on the flood map situation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, you'll recall on December the 19th, the Federal Emergency Management Agency issued the letter of final determination for Beaufort County and the counties involved in the update and the surrounding counties that matched those. Um, since that letter of final determination was issued on December the 19th, um, there is a six-month implementation period at which, um, so in June um, of tw uh, June 19th of 2020, those maps become effective, and the rates essentially change at that time based on those on those uh, maps. Um, that six-month period uh, is is a phase-in period that allows counties uh, and municipalities that are in that change to get their ordinances right. Um, you have received a copy. There was a meeting that the state held here in Beaufort County, actually in the other meeting room on December the 11th, to talk about the new flood ordinance. Um, there is a standard minimum flood ordinance that FEMA has put together, um, and they gave us copies of that. They also provided copies of changes from the prior minimum 
Uh, it's my understanding that when they redid those years ago and provided that minimum template, that's what Beaufort County used when they put their ordinance together. So in the email that was sent to you, it shows what the new minimum is, and it shows what the changes from the old minimum was to the new <coughs> minimum, because there's obviously there, there's been some changes. Um, there are opportunities in that ordinance for the, for the governing body to increase things, to make it more stringent. Um, what we understood was that the last time this was adopted by the board, they took just the minimums, which is what we've done on that. Um, I think the biggest piece on that one is the additional free board. Um, Beaufort County and Hyde County are the two counties in this area um, that are under that update that have their free boards at plus zero, so you don't have to go any higher. Um, some of our surrounding counties say that from free boards you've got to build two feet higher or three foot higher, so they're taking you above that. Uh, in what we've submitted on the minimum um, ordinance that was provided to us from FEMA is that we are staying at zero, so whatever that that free that whatever that baseline is, we're saying plus zero, um, so there are no additional um, burdens on <coughs> homeowners to raise theirs additionally. Um, that's kind of where we are. Uh, again, there is a minimum ordinance that they provide to us that says you have to adopt at least this minimum ordinance to stay in the flood insurance program. Um, we, we've done that. We've changed out the, you know, they give you, a, uh, it's a template. They give you a little space where you change it out and say county of, and it's Beaufort, and, and instead of saying, you know, the town of or those kind of things. Um, we've done that. It's my understanding it's been sent back to, to FEMA to approve, to make sure that it is in compliance, that we haven't done anything or changed anything arbitrarily that's not in compliance with the minimum. Um, and then it will come back to the board for, your, for you to review uh, and to look to adopt if you so choose to do that. Um, there's some, obviously some, some notifications we have to make across everybody across the <coughs> county so that they know that it's upcoming. Um, but we are keeping that at the, at the minimum that, that FEMA requires to be at the minimum. Commissioner uh, Mr. Manager, at what point in this process does it says, you know, we were, we were telling the people that it would reduce their rates by several hundred thousand dollars over the county. At what point do this uh, new flood map affect those costs? There are actually two pieces that go into that. It's my understanding that in, in June, June 19th of 2020, June 19th of this year will be the six-month period. So the, these new elevations, these new maps will come into play, and the insurance folks will be using those new maps. So some people who may have been in the flood zone are now out of the flood zone. Some people who may have not been in the flood zone are now in the flood zone. Um, what we have encouraged people to do and what we continue to message to, to everyone who has flood insurance right now. If you know that your home floods and you are no longer in the flood zone because you may have been taken out, you know, this, is, this is work that FEMA does based on maps and those kind of things. If you are in a, or if you have been taken out of a flood zone and you know that your home floods, do not get rid of your flood insurance. You will be able to get it a whole lot cheaper, but do not drop it because you know where you live and you know what floods. Don't let somebody somewhere else look at a map and tell you you don't need flood insurance. You know where you live and you know what happens. So it will make it a whole lot cheaper for people who are now out of the flood zone uh, to be able to continue to have flood insurance because you can still buy flood insurance. Um, and there is a second piece that is my understanding. I'm not sure it was supposed to be later in the year. I, I assume it is still moving forward where they are, where FEMA is now, has put together a plan where they're using, they're able now to go down to parcel level to determine the flood risk. So they would be able to look specifically, it used to be you're either in the flood zone, you're out of the flood zone. Uh, and that's what it's based on. Now, it's my understanding in this flood something 2.0, that they're actually going to be able to drill down even deeper and say, your house is Yes, it's in the flood zone, but it is, for, my house is closer to the flood hazard than your house is. Uh, your house may be worth more than my house, uh, and it will take into account the exact location of the house, the, the location, the distance from the flood hazard, um, what the rebuild cost of the house would be to more accurately determine what your premium should be as compared to what my premium should be based on my specific circumstance. So it's supposed to be more detailed and a better program. Now, 
that is still out there. They say it's supposed to roll into effect later, I think in the fall, um, but we'll see. But, but that's a new piece of the flood insurance program. Part of the thing is, again, these houses, even though they show them were in the flood zone, you're going to have to have surveyors out there to give you what's the elevation of the first living area, HVAC and all that. So the surveyors there will be quite busy once we get to that point. The, the thing that I was, what I was questioning about is you take on the western part of the county and that going towards Greenville. That, that, that flood insurance is a lot less. When you cross the Pitt County line, there's a lot less than ours. So I was just trying to see that, that uh, I know that certain areas are going to be out of the flood zone as far as the maps are concerned. But the houses gonna still be in, gonna still flood. See what I'm saying? So that's the reason I was trying to see is there was gonna be a reduction in price. I think I think the insurance is more wind and hail. The flood insurance should be, no matter what county you're in, how far you're above a flood. But there's a heck of a difference in wind and hail insurance in both the county and Pitt County. The wind don't blow in Pitt County anymore. But the flood is. I'm gonna kid. Flood insurance is cheaper over there too. Yeah, I don't I don't know, but I know wind and hail is a lot cheaper. Is what you emailed to me, is that what was sent back to FEMA for approval? What we sent to all the board that showed the, the new minimum template, and then the, there were two of them. One was the new minimum template, and the other was the minimum template that showed the changes from the prior minimum template. What we did was we filled out the minimum template. With our, with our, put our name in it, you know, Beaufort County, and updated that kind of stuff, uh, and then kept the the freeboard elevation at plus zero, and then submitted that for them to look at to say yes or no, were we still in compliance? Are we good. Thank you. Okay, Stan. Uh, and this is in relation to what. Uh, you wanted to talk about the sheriff's department, sheriff's office, that, sheriff office. office. We, we can talk about it as a group. It doesn't necessarily have to be a unique man that can speak to it. What we need to do is discuss it. So, um, what are we going to do? What do you want to do? We got a quarter million dollars sitting out there. Is it going to? What, what are we going to do about it? Well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may, what, and the manager, tell me if I'm correct. What this looks like to me is the, the, the sheriff has a piggy bank, and he's, man, he's, he's through over-budgeting. He's accumulated about a quarter of a million dollars in his uh, uh, surplus. And now he's proposing to take that money and divide it up among about 25 or 30 deputies as pay increases. And, you know, I would tell you this, this is not the way we do business in Beaufort County. We have never done anything like this in Beaufort County before. Um, and and the Chief Deputy can certainly speak um, to that. Um, I would say that it's my understanding, if, and if you look at um, the, um, the, la the, the money that's in the salary account has come from lap salaries that the Sheriff's Office is proposing to use. Um, it is from... Um, positions that have not been filled over the last six months or have been hard to fill. Um, so there have been salaries that have lapsed in that. Um, so there is a, there's a request uh, from the sheriff's office to, to use those funds to essentially um, look at what the previous 2017 salary study that, that was done for the county and adjust salaries in the sheriff's office based on essentially what that plan said you should do. Um, and the chief deputy has said we can do that with the funds that have been through lap salaries and that we will commit to holding those changes neutral in the upcoming budget, the 2021 budget, keeping those neutral um, because they have constant turnover or, or they have turnover that, that allows for lap salaries. Um, it, and that's what he's asked to do. Um, the, 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 the question is, you know, it, our, our policy, our personnel policy essentially is silent as it speaks to um, adjusting for increases in a, in a class. Um, so it really doesn't speak to that. It, it does speak to when you hire someone, 
um, that they can be put in at certain levels, but if it goes above the mid-grade, it has to go to the board for approval. Um, it allows for um, people to be placed in specific roles in specific classifications. The board has a pay and classification plan that has a range that says here's the minimum, here's the maximum, and here's the midpoint. Um, uh, the sheriff's office has looked at those and has, it's my understanding and looking at the numbers, has kept those within those ranges. Um, and, and again, as I say, our, our policy is kind of silent on that. It doesn't speak to it. Um, the, the, the sheriff's office through um, him being an independently uh, elected official and having control over his department, uh, his office, uh, excuse me, um, and, and the board's control over certain aspects of that, which the statutes are sometimes clear about, sometimes vague about, uh, in conversations we've had with, uh, with uh, some of the folks at the School of Government. Um, um, the sheriff believes that he's in a position where he can do that and, and not cause an impact to the budget and, and, and do his and, and um, do his thing relating to his folks. Um, and that's kind of where it is. Well, let me ask a couple more questions. What are the rest of the county employees going to do with the lap salary surpluses that are in their departments? Are we going to take that money and divide it up among the employees as a salary increase? And I would say the second thing to you, why do we do a budget at all if we're going to do business this way? Because this is just dividing up a honey pot, is as simple as it is. Number three, we've got a personnel policy. That personnel policy puts people into categories and puts them into steps and stages and all this sort of thing. Let's just throw that out the window because that's what we're doing here today. And number three, if we give a quarter of a million dollars, allow this to happen a quarter of a million dollars this year, guess what? It's a quarter, another quarter of a million dollars. Next year, a quarter of a million dollars. You're increasing the budget. We have already done one thing in, in budgeting in the Sheriff's Department we never should have done. We took a fifty-nine or a $69,000 appropriation for body cameras, and we made that, in, instead of a one-year uh, expenditure, we made it into a four-year expenditure. We converted it into about, two, about $250,000. Uh, this is, this is as I'll say this, this is absolutely outrageous that anybody would even think about this, and it's even more outrageous that anybody would propose it. May I please make several Good. comments? Um, first off, I'll start off with um, there was reference that the county manager made to the pay study that was done roughly about three years ago now. Um, I, I don't know if any of the commissioners have ever had to go through a pay study, but pretty much in essence what you're bringing in as people that you're paying is being experts in the level of what people should be paid, how they should be valued, and then in comparison they look at how things are in the local area and, and like positions throughout the state. And then you have these people that come in and interview each and every one of your employees where they are telling them how they are undervalued and how corrective actions are going to be taken, you know, to make sure that some of those inequities are taken care of. And then at the end of that, uh, at the end of that study, um, it was debated and it was decided at that time that, that nothing was going to be done in reference to the pay study. That there was a cost of living increase that was put in that year for all employees, but there was nothing that was in line to fix some of the equity issues or the compression issues when it comes to different statuses and ranks throughout all county government, not just the sheriff's office. Now, the sheriff's office is particularly affected by compression because we, we, are, we, can, we carry ourselves as a paramilitary organization, which means that your pay is based on your rank in a lot of ways. Your responsibilities are based on your rank in a lot of ways. The authority and the, 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 your job and your responsibilities are based and, and carried out by the, the sheriff through the command staff and the chain of command to make sure that we adhere to those, that we're not asking somebody that we're paying $40,000 to do the work of somebody who should be getting paid 60000 and we do that. We police that on ourselves. But that means that we have to, that the system needs to make sense. So what we decided to do, and it's we, it's the sheriff and I, we sat down and we crunched the numbers, 
and we took the information that was gathered and used through that pay study that the commission paid for, and we started to implement the things that we could do along the way. So for the first two years, we, we and sorry, I'm getting over a cold, um, but for the first two years, we got the pay of the entry-level deputies, detention officers, and telecommunicators up. And we did that as we hired people. We did that as they got promoted to first-line to first line supervision. We did that in a lot of ways. So we've taken care of the, the, sal the salary inequities that the, that the study said that we should have taken care of for our entry-level folks, which leaves our supervisors. That takes a little bit more time. And the timing of what we have going on right now actually goes back to the end of last fiscal year's budget and the beginning of this one when we ask for more help to take care of a lot of the transports and the things that we needed to do involving the jail situation. And it was debated and it was decided that we weren't going to do that. And I said at that point and before and I've said after that that we are dealing with an unsustainable issue with the people that we have with the way things are going. So that is a part of it. That's a part of what we're doing. So we moved some positions from the jail, and we moved some positions from the 911 center to put them in places that we can use them more effectively with the tasks that we have at hand. Now, part of that was to get us to where we are here. You know, and I would have been able to have a better picture for you as far as the numbers go if the things that asked for and were or needed to be implemented at the beginning of this fiscal year were done, even to the point of Commissioner Richardson asking for our org chart several times. We have our org chart, but it's not I'm not ready to give you the updated up chart because we don't have the paperwork backing from HR at the county level for us even to implement some of those changes to make it to the point that on paper we would look how we actually look in real life. And I want you to see that paper when it's real, not when it's just in make-believe. So... All of that being said to get to this point, lap salary is the thing that occurs. You know, we have 107 full-time employees if we are full. And I'll venture a guess and say that we are hardly ever going to be full for long periods of time. So we are going to get lap salary from time to time. As we got into January, I was looking at our numbers based off of what we needed to get, and your, the number that we're throwing out there is a quarter of a million. Well, it's a quarter of a million cut in half for this next six months. That's what we need to pay for this year. And I understand that it's a recurring cost next year, but the amount of, of, of balance in just the salary line is enough to cover the cost of the check for each one of these changes that we're looking to implement and put in place. And what we're saying as an agency, which I don't think it should be any different than what the county's saying as an overall individual, as a group of people who, I don't, you know, whether you care for employees or not, whether you want to, you know, whether you want to badmouth them, you know, for doing their job, you know, that's, that's more of your prerogative than ours. But our priority and our first priority is to take care of our employees because they are, they, they are the most valuable resource that we have as an agency. And then we figure out how to support the people that we have with the operations budget and the capital budget, which are the other two functional lines that we have at the sheriff's office. So we have figured out a way. The math is, now I'm a, I'm a simple country boy from, that grew up in Greenville and went to D.H. Conley High School, but I'm pretty darn good with the calculator. And I've got five years of experience with dealing with everybody in this room that shows I am pretty good with the calculator. The math is sound. The money is there to cover the check that we are asking to do. And we are giving you assurances that we are going to come back forward with a neutral budget, which no other agency is going to give you that in a year of growth in a county. I can guarantee you that, but the reason that we can give you those assurances is because we've done that in the past. We've been asked in the past to come up with neutral budgets, and we've done them at least two times in the last five years. It's not, it's not really all that difficult. It's about prioritizing what you've got in front of you and then figure out a way to pay for it through being smart in what we ask for, and then shrewd negotiation with the board, and then it's approved or it's not approved. And then we adapt to whatever's adjusted. With the threats that commissioners have given me several times since the time that I've been on the spot that I am that says, we only have to give you two deputies and two cars, you are absolutely correct. But you're not going to do that because it's not, it's not the right thing to do. 
We're doing the right thing here. We've got a way to pay for it. We've got a plan to move on forward, and we're looking forward to negotiate that in next year's budget process. Mr. Langman. And, and while I understand everything that, that, that you have said, uh, the one thing that, that bothers me, and I, and I wasn't out here when you first started, is, is you, you, you indicated that, that, that you guys would make uh, adjustments in, in, in some of your line <coughs> items. And the one that struck a nerve with me was the detention center. I mean, because I've, I've always I said for the past three, four years, that is a money pit. And I, I don't think the county has enough money to handle all the problems that constantly arise in that detention center. And so therefore, that particularly bothers me that, that you want to cut that, cut back the, the, the funds that go to the jail. Well, that was, that was a specific cut. If you, if you think about it, we in last year's budget we increased the amount of detention officers because of the, the new regulations in 14J. And now over the last year, we've gone from a 85-bed facility to a 27-bed facility. So it is smarter for us to utilize the resources that we have in moving those people from place to place than it would be for me to have two detention officers doing rounds when one detention officer FTE can take care of those. You know, we, um, we, we specialize in doing more with less. That is, that should be government's motto throughout the world. We are going to do more with less. Now, there are some phases of government that they are fat with money. The agencies that I run are not. We have to squeeze every bit that we get so we can do the tasks that we do, and we are effective at getting those done. So, no, we're not looking to rob Peter to pay Paul. We're not looking to do, make silly mistakes when it comes to this, and we are not looking to pay our friends just for the sake of paying our friends. I have walked more friends to the door when we are firing them than I have people that I don't like. And if the situation comes up and the job comes up to do that tomorrow, then I'll do it again. That doesn't have anything to do with it. This is about taking care of our people, not just willy-nilly. We're using a study that you guys pay for, and I thank you for that. And we're going by that playbook. And we're looking to do this and give you a coupon for next year. We're not going to be asking for drones and predators just in case an Iranian general shows up at the, one of our handy marks and we can take them out. We're asking for things that we are looking to take care of and we are offering ways that we can help you as the governing board pay for that. So, so what you, what you, you're saying that you moved the facility from 85 to 27. And so, therefore, from your logic, it, you planned on it remaining that way. And well, so that means a portion of the jail will be closed. For the next foreseeable future, yes, sir. I mean, there hadn't been a hammer struck on metal. I, I, and, I, and, I, and I understand that, but I, I'm, I'm looking at it more than this year. Sure. I'm talking next year, the following year. I, I mean, just, just help me to... So, so I've given you everything that I can that leads up to a guarantee for the next fiscal year. Now, we, we and, and this is my opinion, and I know that you're not going to agree with that, but at the Sheriff's Office, we do more mid-range and long-range planning and more strategic planning than, it, than at least on face value what I hear from the commissioners when we're talking about overall facilities and operations in the county. So we know what we want to be doing in three years, and in five years, and in seven years. But a lot of that ultimately comes up with the funding that we receive. You know, so we know that we have to be flexible in the things that we do. Now, one of the things that I haven't hit on, but I need to make sure that we hit on here, is that we are not violating any law. We are not violating any policy on the state level. 
We are not violating any policy on the local level when it comes to anything that we're looking to do with this. Nothing. Other department heads can do the same thing through the county manager that we're looking to do. Now, I will say that it is probably unprecedented on the scale that we're talking. But if, if I sent one or two of these to the county manager every week for the last 38 weeks, would we be having this conversation? But that's not the way that we want to do business. We want to be up front, but we also wanted this to be, we did not know that this was going to be even discussed at this county commissioner's meeting really until about Friday, this last Friday. It's not on the agenda, but once again, we're here, we've got the information, and, and we are willing to work and wanting to work with it. But statute, General Statute 153A92 talks about compensation. And, it, and you know, I, I guess anything can be interpreted, interpreted in many different ways, but the two sections really that go into it, it says is that the commissioners set a salary scale, a plan for the county. I've got my copy right here. Every budget year, there's three or four pages. Usually it's around 16, 17, and 18 of that big budget book that comes out. That's the salary plan. The statute says that you put that in place, and you have. And then in Section C of that, it says that the county is with the county manager. The county manager is the one that makes sure that that, that plan is being taken care of, meaning that nobody's going around giving raises to somebody who should be getting made $40,000, and we're paying them $80,000 if it's not in that scale. So it is unprecedented on the amount of folks, but we've got the funds to cover it, and we're not talking about future funds. We've got funds in the bank now to cover this change for the next six months in those lap salary without even having anything to be put in to that same line. And if I'm wrong on that, then we do have the finance officer here that can speak on it, um, but it's there. So. I say all of that to say to this, every change that's making to supervisors, so if it's a telecommunications supervisor, then they've got a scale. And the change that we're looking to make on an individual basis for that would fall underneath the number within that range. And every other person within this change that we're looking to make, the same thing. We're not moving people out of classes. We're not changing that, and we're not looking to give people raises out of that class that we're, that we're looking to do. So within the rules, we're within the policy, the money's there, and the, the suggestions that we're doing, we didn't just make up, they were part of that pay study. Well, let's talk about money as the sheriff's department. Let's talk about money in the sheriff's department and overpayment and overtime in particular. Every, except three or four, of your telecommunicators are making ten thousand dollars a year in overtime. Sure. There was, and you've got like four vacancies in there. And no, no, sir, we how many vacancies you have? I think right now we have three. Okay. Which is not not, not that different. No. Now well, let's it's not. But if we're talking money, let's be pretty precise about what we're talking. No, about. I don't have to be precise. I, I, I'm, I've been looking at the overtime schedule for the whole county, so I'm familiar with what I'm talking about, Charlie. And and you are aware that with the number of telecommunicators that we have and the way that we have worked telecommunicators far before I became a part of any planning for this is that we have to pay them overtime at the 40-hour level. Well, they're on the 12-hour schedule that the deputies are on, right? Yeah, but they get paid differently because deputies get paid on a 28-day cycle. Whatever, whatever, but it's not 25% of their base salary is overtime. <coughs> that, I'm sure, is not the case. If it is, we're going to be taking a hard look at that. Oh, now, let me ask you this question. Like you, you're short three people in that department. You're paying all this overtime. We had an employee that worked for the county that within the last two months went to Pitt County to work as a telecommunicator. Sure. Why wasn't that employee offered a job in your department? You're going to have to go through one more time? One we time. had an employee who left the employment of Beaufort County and went to Pitt County to work as a telecommunicator Did they who was not a us? telecommunicator. Did they apply with us? I don't know. Well, I mean, I, it's kind of hard for me to answer that if the person never came and talked to us. Well, we can find out. From, can you find out from personnel, Mr. Manager, whether that person, and I'll identify her not here in public, 
and we can find out whether she ever applied or not. But I'm looking at people in your department in telecommunications that are making ten and twelve thousand dollars a year in overtime. I'm looking at people in the jail that are making a lot of overtime with the jail population being like 27 when it should be 80 something. How do you do that? You have to work at it in order to make that thing work out that way. That's, that's not good management. I'm looking at deputies. How, what's the highest, what's percentage wise, how much overtime does your highest overtime deputy make? How, and what, and what? Anywhere. And what scale do you want to deny? Sworn hours? deputy to percentage of to base salary percentage of overtime. Okay. Um, the drug unit as a whole would get more overtime than probably any other specific group because of the nature of what they do. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and How much overtime are you paying in the drug unit? Percentage of base salary. Um, I, I don't have that number here, um, but I'll say that it's at 171 hours is when overtime would start over a 28-day cycle, and on average, those guys probably work in between 200 and 210 hours during that cycle. You've got employees in the drug unit that are going. To, one guy is going to make thirty thousand dollars in overtime this year, with a base salary of like fifty-five. Sure in that neighborhood. So, I mean, you know, you got $85,000 deputies and you're in here asking for pay increases for people. You've got other deputies that are making eight and 10,000 and I'm not talking about one and two, one or two. I'm talking about, you're up here telling me what a great manager you are and I'm here telling you you're not a great manager with what I'm looking at in, in managing overtime. Sure. There's no control on overtime. Can, can you take a breath so I can speak now? The, so overtime, you know, overtime is used so we can pay people for doing the work that is above and beyond what they would normally do. We want to pay people for doing that. Um, our, our drug unit specifically, you want to hit on them for that. The, the work that they do is that they do surveillance on jobs that they're going to be doing later. They're making arrests on people that they're doing projects on now. They are, they are stopping the things that are happening in front of them. They don't work an 8-to-5 job because drug dealers and people who commit crimes don't work 8-to-5. Now, if you can give me an 8-hour period of time that we can effectively do that, with, then, then please let me know. But as a law enforcement agency, as a law enforcement agency, we have been hitting on all cylinders for a long time. We are not having to deal with the stuff that every other area around us is having to deal with when it comes to gangs, when it comes to violence, when it comes to homicides, when it comes to rapes, when it comes to violence at school, when it comes to everything that is talked about when commissioners are trying to get elected. And I'm not asking for your thanks on that, but it's not done just by accident. It's done because we know what we're doing. We are the largest and most dynamic law enforcement agency in Beaufort County. And we're taking care of business in the county and in the cities that we're asking more and more to take hold of. We have overtime, and we're doing overtime because we don't have enough hours in the day to do the tasks that we're supposed to. Now, half of the overtime that we're spending is going directly to do transports to people in and out of our facility that is provided by commissioners that is in shambles, and we're having to take people from Murphy to Manio to house them. Let me answer that. You're having to do these transports because you didn't keep up the jail doors in the jail. You let them go completely to hell, and then you didn't call for repairmen in January to repair them, and we're back in here sitting with a million and a half dollars we're looking at in the county because you, the sheriff's department, did not call repair people to repair the jail cells. So don't start this stuff, Charlie. I know what's going on. The buildings that we operate. Mr. Chairman. I, I move that we adjourn. This item was never on, on the agenda. original agenda, agenda, and it was added for discussion. And if there's additional information that needs to be Did done, to I would ask Commissioner Richardson to make that known. Mr. Booth's got one thing. Mr. Booth, go ahead. Hold on. Put the mic on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Sorry. Charlie, I'm, I want to be the first to tell you I'm not here to micromanage what you do, and I appreciate what you do. But I've been, I've been hearing about this increase before Christmas. 
and I made it my policy. I told you whatever money that we fund, that it, where you spend it, that's up to y'all. I'm not going to micromanage how you spend your money. But when I sat down and read that, and, and, and thank you for uh, alerting me, that the study that I said we shouldn't have never done to start with because we didn't have the money to make it right to start with, thank you for telling us that we are probably, from your numbers, that you just said here and told me that you have 30 people that you, that you divided $240,000. Is that correct? Was it 30 people? It's probably closer to 40 in total. Um, okay. Well, I, if it's 40, I find, it very, I find it very, very disturbing that we as Beaufort County is $8,000 behind any other county, behind Hyde, behind Craven, behind Martin. Thank you for bringing that out. But not, did each doing that for $240,000, was it divided evenly? amongst those deputies or what did some get fifteen thousand and some get three okay um first off on the study th there were actually numbers that were provided and it was debated between the commission and i want to say the total for the county if all of those phases were input were was it 1.6 million yes 1.2 million 1.2 so you know 300 and 25, I don't know how many total employees that the about county takes. About 400. So, okay. So of that, in that count, and I know it's weird between whether we're county employees or not, but you pay us, and mm -hmm. I thank you. Mm -hmm. My light bill needs to get paid. So we are a part of that number. So just think about that. You know, of a group of 377, but it wasn't 377 when we were talking about that, when we were talking about the study. You know, there's probably been some expansion since then. And we're talking at 1.2 was the total number. So with what we've already done and what we're looking to do, with, the, with that being in place and a quarter of a million dollars can fix the, the compression and the inequities in the pay, if you looked at the overall picture of the county, then we're actually coming in under what our numbers would suggest that it should be for, for, for 400. That's that part. Now, as far as the scale, can I... With what you've done, sure. But I find it very, very, very disturbing that we are eight thousand dollars less now. If we, if forty people, I, I don't, I don't know what that means. But, well, what I'm saying is, if we had two hundred and forty thousand, you, you took you, this this increase that you're proposing is two hundred and forty thousand dollars, right? For next year? No, for the, the, no, 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 no. We're talking for this year. The amount of money that we have to cover is half of that. So that will be 120000 Which is already in the coffers for, for the salary line. I got you. An amount of money that is going to be used for something by the county sometime. But right now we're talking about having the ability last year, which was in a tough year. Last year was a tough year. And your people were able to get resources to put close to a million dollars in unrestricted fund balance in a tough year. This year is going to be a better year than that. And we're looking to affect changes that we can already cover. The check's, the check's not going to bounce if we issue it now. At that 120000 mark is what we're looking for this year. And then to be negotiated in next year and next year and next year forever and ever and amen. So the numbers we got was, was bogus numbers. <coughs> no, sir. I, I mean, the numbers... I, no, I was, no, sir. I got $240,000. Two hundred forty thousand dollars, and there was thirty people. Wait. I done the math, and I divided uh, thirty into two hundred forty thousand. It came to eight thousand dollars per person, which I don't have a problem. If you got the money to do it, like I said, I'm not here to micromanage you. So, but so, I, and I would always say, sir, to the rest of the department heads, if you are kind and keen enough to have some lap salaries, I would do it too. I would do it too because in this county, it's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission. Thank you. We've got a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Well, I want to say that there's not deputies in, in Hyde County that are making $48,000 a year road deputies. That, that is incorrect. The folks that on their islands, they make more than that. I will, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. If you're going to be right, be all right. All those opposed? Six to one.